Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our service of worship. We are glad that you are with us today. Those of you that are in this room and those who are greeting us and meeting with us at home. Um, it's interesting. Um, I got a text from uh, um, Kathy and Gary saying that they could not be here what was studying last week because someone was exposed to someone else who had the, the virus. And I said, isn't it amazing that every time we say someone is not feeling well, we have to qualify it. But it's not COVID. But it's not COVID. John and Emma are not here today, but it's not COVID. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm glad that you are here. You know, I heard something very interesting this past week that, and, and I have the greatest respect for Dr. John MacArthur, but he got COVID. And I, I don't know how many in his congregation got it. And so that's one of the reasons we're trying to be as careful as, as we can. And when you come in here, you know that uh, we're trying to keep this place as clean as we can and trust that God will continue to show his favor to us. But um, uh, we, have to, we have to overcome this fear. And I trust that God will give us the timing to do that. Um, thank you again for being here this morning. May I remind you that uh, tonight, for my class, there'll be no class. Tonight, this, we, we agreed with that last weekend. This is, um, this is um, Labor Day weekend, but, but that is not why. Um, my, my, my son is down from Seattle visiting his sister because our grandson is leaving the end of this month for Hawaii. He isn't going skateboarding, not skateboarding, surfing. He's going to YWAM school. And um, so this is the only time Christopher has to be down. So he came down this week to be with them and we're gonna be gathering for a little bit um, later on uh, for this time. Um, I, I have a very, very um, interesting, I don't know how to explain it, um, a very um, unique announcement to make. That, that right following the service, there'll be a wedding celebration. We will be, we will be meeting under the beautiful tree out there this beautiful day. And um, I, I, I should let you know who's going to be married. <laughs> Steve and Elizabeth, will you stand so they can see who will be getting married? And, and you're invited, if you're able to stay, to have a bit of refreshments afterwards. We welcome you, and we wish them God's blessing. Uh, Shirley was able to um, have successful surgery this past week, still in some um, uncomfortable pains. Uh, uh, Warren got his new eye, and we look forward to seeing him um, pretty soon. And um, so we thank God for these mercies he has given to us. There are other concerns we have which we, we, we will bring to you when we go to the time of prayer, but those are the announcements. Oh, by the way, this coming Wednesday night is our prayer time, and I invite you, please join us. We are desperately in need of praying people, a praying church is a strong church, and we want to see God break down walls that he has promised to break down as we ask him to do that. So please um, join us on, uh, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Those are the announcements, and now we will just switch a little bit to have our call to worship. I'll give you 
Thank you. Please be seated. Among those that we will be praying for this morning <coughs> is Mar <coughs> Marlon and Tina. The, uh, the memorial service took place yesterday at Fairview Mennonite Church for the, um, the deceased, and it was a wonderful time of fellowship together and um, the high standard that the people had for uh, Marlon's dad. You can see why Marlon is a chip off the block. And, uh, and um, they thank us for our prayers for his, uh, his widow now. And we want to pray today for Shirley again with her surgery she had this past week and for give God thanks for um, Warren's um, this long night is finished for him as such. And I guess um, I'm, I'm sure that they went through some process by which he learned how to use one eye. Uh, but I'm quite sure that we live in such a wonderful world now that uh, they think of everything for us, but we want to pray for him as well. And to remember, um, <clears throat> To remember Art and Doris, and Doris, of course, um, Art's wife, with both of them having um, medical issues. And for those who are with, not with us today because of not feeling well and so on, we trust that it's nothing more than the anything but the dreaded C-19. Let us pray. We come to you, our God, this morning like the psalmist did. And he asked God, let our voice rise to you in your ears that you might hear us. We live in a noisy world, Lord. We don't need to tell you that. And there are times even among your people that we, you have to compete with other things for us to either talk with you or for you to talk with us. And coming into this house this morning gives us an opportunity to just be still for a few moments, to recognize and to adore and to acknowledge you because of who you are. Help us not to use your name without bowing to its glory. Help us not to ask of God if we reject his laws. Help us, our God, to truly desire to know you, to join with the creatures in heaven who never, never get tired of giving God praise and doing his will. And, and Father, we pray this morning that the Spirit of God will teach us, will unveil to us something of the majesty of the God we adore. This is what your word teaches, Lord. You are clothed in light. When Moses asked if he would see your glory, you told him, no man can see my glory and live. But we thank you that you answered that prayer for us when the Lord Jesus came and revealed the glory in human flesh. And I pray, O oh God, that that being the case, we will bow down. Our spirits, our hearts will be humbled in your presence this morning. Give us eyes to see by faith what ordinary eyes cannot see, ears to hear what ordinary ears cannot hear, and Father, may we sense the Spirit of God moving in our midst, allowing us, our God, to draw near to God, who because of the death and resurrection of his Son can draw near to us. We confess, our Father, our dependence upon you. We confess our needs to be forgiven for our sins, and we do not say that gladly. We are saved sinners. You have, you have redeemed us with the blood of your Son. 
you have made us to be a people of God where before we were not. And so we come this morning gladly, humbly, joyfully to give you praise. Because when we cannot face ourselves, when sometimes we are embarrassed at what we know about ourselves, we are reminded that God knew it before we did. And he provides for our cleansing, for our pardon. So we stand in grace this morning. Help us to live it out. Father, we thank you for those who have been cared for medically this past week, for Shirley and for Warren. And Lord, they, there may have been others that we are not aware of at this time, but we thank you for these two. We continue to pray for Art and for Doris and ask that you will minister to them. For those who are at home this morning, because of the concern they have for others and the way they are feeling, we pray that you will be with them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will comfort Marlon and Tina and his mother as they said goodbye to Marlon's dad this, uh, this, uh, yesterday. And Lord, as Marlon said, this is when his mother is beginning to feel it. They had been married for a long, long time. And Lord, it will be so strange not to have her husband beside her. But we thank you that both these people have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they are trusting in his, his finished work in Calvary to once again be reunited in that glad, glad and glorious day we called our blessed hope. We ask that you will remember Donna and Doris and Russ. We thank you for these folks, Lord. They are not able to be with us now. They can't even get out of their building, some of them. But we lift them to you this morning. We pray, Father, for Dorothy at home, Pam's mother, and ask that, Lord, you will truly comfort her as she is, Lord, grieving the loss of a good friend this past week. And, Lord, we ask that you will remember uh, Viola in her work with the, with the um, veterans' place. And so, Lord, we have great, great needs. But we come to you. God is our refuge and our strength. He is our very present help in trouble. So whatever burdens these might have and whatever burdens we have brought, brought into this place, we cast them upon you right now. We thank you for hearing us. Even the groanings you said, Lord, in your word, you have heard the groans of your people and may you have... Lord, picked up the groans from some heart in this place this morning or at home or beyond, Lord, where we are this morning. We ask that you will remember we, as we pray for our work in Bolivia this morning where several of the church leaders have died from COVID and they are grieving over this and they need to replace these leaders and they've asked us to pray to pray that God will be merciful to them and provide for them. And we do, Lord. We thank you this morning, Father, for that great word we heard from Minda this past week from, Lord, her, what happened 40 years ago. And in a very marvelous and wonderful way, you brought two people together who did not realize 40 years prior that they had been in each other's presence and what how Minda ministered to this lady, and today she's reminding Minda of her faithfulness to God then. We thank you for Minda and commit her to you. We do pray, Father, for the Bormans who are traveling across this country to raise support. And we ask again that as we seek to make contact with them, that we will be able to have a night with them as we did with the Nelsons. Lord, there are burdens that we are not aware of, but we commit our people to you because when one hurts, we all hurt. And so we commit 
each of them to you this morning. We do ask that you will remember the leaders of the country. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in, in Afghanistan, those who are still, Lord, in hiding because of what has happened. Please be merciful, O oh God, to our brothers and sisters in Christ there. We know, we don't know them personally, but they belong to the body of Christ. And we are told to pray for those who are in prison as, those we are there with, as, as though we are there with them. And so we thank you that we can commit them to you. And Lord, we, we continue to pray too. It comes to mind now for Steve as he continues to get treatment for um, the cancer to prevent it. And we pray that the treatment will work and will be effective in what they're seeking to do. So Lord, hear us now. We give you thanks for those who have laid aside a portion of what you have given them. I pray that they might be able, Lord, to uh, rejoice that even though the plates are not there, and I, I noticed yesterday at the service that the offering boxes were at the, the, uh, the door the same way they are here. So we thank you that we're not alone. We, and that, Lord, we do pray too for um, um, the, the, the ministry that we, we're seeking to, not to get back to where we were, but to excel from where we were. Give us wisdom as we try to um, put together, Lord, the ministry that will minister to everyone. And Lord, that it will, um, it will bring glory to you. And so for all these mercies, Lord, we give you our grateful thanks. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand to sing with us once again our song of praise. And I don't know what that song is. Yes, the call of the kingdom. Please be seated. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles, please, or however you turn in your Bibles, to two passages this morning, one message from two passage. I call your attention, first of all, to Ephesians chapter 1, and it's hard to break in at any point with Ephesians because the Apostle Paul seemingly was so overcome by the wonder that he just talked and talked and talked, and you don't know where he ended and where he's beginning. So I am beginning at verse 22 of chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, 
verse 22. And he, the he there is talking of God, the sovereign father, he. He is reflecting and remembering what happened at the, the resurrection. And he then, God, put all things in subjection under his feet, talking of Jesus. So here we have the father who is uh, designing the body as we're going to be talking about under his feet, the Lord Jesus and gave him, Jesus, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness, who fills all in all. And then over to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1 and verse 18. He is also head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. And then just across the page, chapter 2 of Colossians and verse 19. And again, I should begin in, in, in uh, 18. Let no, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement, and the worship of angels, taking his stand on various vision he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joint, by joints and ligaments, grows into, grows with a, a, a growth which is from God. This is the word of God. Father, as we are about to look into your word and to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us, opening our understanding of what this text is saying to us, may we know this morning that God has visited with us in a very unique way that we might truly, again, hold on to the head from whom the whole body is fitted together. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing our prayer together as we wait for the word of God to be preached. So, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation in our hearts 
derive, have their origin in God, so that God alone will be heard and worshipped this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Some time ago, a survey was taken on what is the church. And one person gave this answer to which I want to respond this morning. And here was the answer they gave. I am my own church. I am my own church. I want to suggest to you that nothing could be further from the truth than that. And that's what we want to see this morning. My title for the message this morning is Images of the Church. There are several images given, and for the next two weeks I'll be focusing on this one and the one next, next week. Metaphors used in the Bible for the church, a family, a bride, a vineyard, a temple, a building, building, a kingdom, a flock. Those are images used for the church. The one that I want to focus on this morning is the body. The church as a body. And the question I want to just delve into is what is the source of this idea? Where do these images come from? And I remind you that they are scriptural. They are from the Bible. They are not ideas of antiquity. As we look, for example, in Colossians 1 and 18 and Ephesians 1, we are, we are told that the church is the body of Christ. So the church then, the church, this idea of a body is rooted in the scriptures. The term body is used 30 plus times in the New Testament for the church. 30 plus times. And if it is used that often, that tells you how important this, this image is. No other image has that amount of recognition. The, the, the central idea, then, is that when you think of the church... Something is happening in our minds that gives us an idea of what truly is the church. And, and, and we can understand this in the metaphor used in the idea of a body. Let me first of all give you a definition, a definition of a body or the church, if you please. A definition. Here it is. The church as a body is a community of believers who are united by a common head. The church as a body is a community of believers who are united by a common head. According to Ephesians 1 and Colossians 18, Jesus Christ is that head. And the question that, that we want to ask ourselves is what is meant by head? Now the word head in the New Testament has several meanings. It could be my head, it could be the head of an animal. But when it is used of Christ, I think two, two ideas just spring immediately in, in, into, into our minds. One, as a head, he is the authority. He is the authority. He speaks not to get my opinion. He speaks as the one who has the final say, the first and the last say in what takes place in, in the church. Uh, you remember when Peter uh, had expressed that Jesus Christ was the son of the living God? And um, he... He's, and, and Jesus said, I'm going to be going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified. Peter said, not so, Lord. And Jesus rebuked him immediately. You don't say what I am to do or where I do not go. That is what Satan tries to do. And so if you question my authority, 
you're playing into the hands of the devil. That's the definition. But we want to look just briefly, and I'll come back to it, to the development of the body. How do you and how do I become a part of this body? As you know, one of the most amazing things is, is, is the birth of a child. When a child is born, you know that, that there, was, there was the mystery of a husband and a wife. You know that, that nine months after, after the whole process taking place, there would be a living being in, uh, coming into the world. Well, that's not how the church is developed. L- l- let me tell you how the church is developed. Ephesians 4.25 says that God, our Christ, loved the church and gave himself for it. How did he give himself for it? He gave himself for it on the cross. We are told in in Revelation chapter 5 that when Jesus died, he brought men and women from every tribe and tongue and nation. And we will look at this in a few minutes uh, later on. But the development of the church was not, was not by a, a, may I say, a committee? Charles Spurgeon said the best committee with which to work is a committee of one. Because when, 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 you, when, when you work with a committee, and this is not, I'm not saying I agree with Charles Spurgeon, okay? I mean, who am I to disagree with Charles Spurgeon anyway? But what, what he's saying is this, that if, if you have a committee, you will have the opinion of everyone. And what is needed in a committee is some head that can pour into the body what is necessary to make it think alike. Because don't forget that the ultimate purpose of the body of the church is that we may all have the same mind. And what is that mind? It's the mind of Christ. It's not my mind. It's not your mind. It is the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you. And when the church was was waiting, waiting, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, the scripture says in Acts chapter 1, they were all in one place with one mind. And friends, you'll be surprised what that one mind can do for all the aspects of life. Because we think if we all have one mind, as someone said, everyone won't agree with me because if everyone did, everyone would be married to my wife. <laughs> but that's not what it is talking about. Because you see, in, in, verse, in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, listen to what it says. In this body, there is neither Jew or Greek or slave or free. The source and the supplier is the same. The big word for us today is diversity, isn't it? Everybody is concerned about diversity. And in the body of Christ, there is unity and there is diversity. We, 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 we were talking about this last evening around the supper table. That, that when, when people say, <laughs> people say to me, you know, I'm colorblind. I say, I'm, I feel sorry for you, because I'm not. <laughs> I know a man and a woman when I see one. I know someone who is dark, someone who is white. I know someone who is, who, who is rich and someone who is poor. The Bible is not talking about diversity, my friends, in the way that we think of it. It is talking about diversity in a way in which God brings together people from every background together and unite them so that they begin to find their juices, if you please, from the head. This is where it comes from. And so diversity, really, in a real sense, diversity can only be demonstrated in the church of Jesus Christ. Every other, every other society, there are people who are up and down, those who lead and those who don't, those who have and those who, those who do not have. But there's always something to differentiate us. 
But in the body of Christ, we do not relate to one another from our background. We relate to one another from the head. Listen, listen to what Jesus said, and I don't understand this verse. I, I confess it to you. In John 17, Jesus said this, The glory which I had with you, talking to his Father in heaven, I have given to them that they might be one. To them, not to him, not to Peter, not to James, not to John, but to Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, to everyone. And so, and, and, and Jesus is praying now. Jesus is praying. And I pray not only for these to whom I am giving that glory, but for those who will believe in my name because of them. I was reading this morning from Acts chapter 10 and 11. And, and, and the disciples, when they were scattered, went to different places, to Cyrene and Antioch. And the believers in Jerusalem heard that in Antioch, people were coming to Jesus Christ because of the message of salvation. <laughs> and, and, and the first one, the first Gentile to come to Christ after salvation was Cornelius. And, and, and God had sent Peter to Cornelius' home. And the first thing Cornelius said, when he, well, a part that J, a Peter said when he went into the home was, you know it's not lawful for a Jew to go into the home of a Gentile. But God has shown me, but God has shown me that there's no partiality with God. God does relate to us as man and woman, boy, girl, father, mother, daughter, son. But that is not what our identity is. Our identity is that we are united to Jesus Christ, and by being united to Jesus Christ, my friends, it breaks down every other barrier. It doesn't do away, you know, with anything else that we would like to get rid of, no. We remain who we are, but we are changed. Our spiritual DNA has been changed. That's what we have in Christ. So the definition, our rare community, the development, the Holy Spirit is the one who does it, and the diversity is what makes it unique. But it's also reflected in nature. This whole idea of the body, the church as a body, is reflected in nature. The analogy of the human body is used to explain the function of this spiritual body. The key function is unity, and so is the human body. The human body cannot, you know, I'm quite sure, if, if not all of you, watch the Olympics. And as you watch the Olympics, you watch those runners, and as you watch those runners, as, as, especially, um, when they were doing the relay race. Uh, supposing when this, the first runner got up to the second runner, gave the baton, and she decided, oh, I don't feel like using it right now. It wouldn't work. Because the whole idea of what is happening is unity and harmony. But, but, but there's something else. There's something else. As you watch those runners, and I, I, I watched it deliberately, as they, as they were running, the arms would move in connection with the leg. And, 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 and you look at some of them, and they're, they're, they're just below their eyes, it was jumping every time they made a stride forward. Everything was working together. It's a beautiful thing to see. And, and, and Paul, by inspiration, is saying, that's precisely what happens to the body. The body of Jesus Christ works like a sprinter who has prepared him or herself to become involved in the function of the body. And, and you know, I heard, I, heard some, I heard someone say this one. It was interesting on our way here. We were listening to two messages from one from Ohio and another one from uh, uh, Washington State. And, and both of them were talking about the body. 
And I thought, this is quite interesting. And, and one pastor said this, I've never heard this, and I'm, I'm not thinking this, but he said, <laughs> I'm quoting, okay? He said, sometimes God sends you to church to sanctify me. Because I know you bug me. But he does not send me to church to know that you are bugging me. He is sending you to church for me to know how to respond to you when you bug me. No, I, 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 that's in quotes. Okay. <laughs> but have, have, you ever, have you thought, my friends, of what, what Paul is saying? That nature shows us for the effectiveness of the body, it must work together, each part doing what is needed for its proper functioning. Now, one of the books that I took down from my library, and I've been engrossed in this book for the last few hours, is a book called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, written by Phil Yancey and Dr. Paul Brand. Dr. Paul Brand worked in India with people who uh, had leprosy and so on. Marvelous, marvelous book. They have just reprinted it, actually. But listen to, listen to what Dr. Brandt says. And, and I'm just going to give you his conclusion. And he's saying, sometimes he thinks of the body in this way, and as he searches to try and find some, some uh, cause as to why certain parts of the body... I mean, just a beautiful book. He said this, I sometimes think of the human body as a community. And he's talking about the cells. This is, this is this chapter on the cells. I think of the human body as a community. And then of its individual cells, such as, and, and its individual cells, such as the white cells. The cell is the basic unit of an organism. It can live for itself, or it can help form and sustain larger organisms organism. I read that and I paused. We will see in 1 Corinthians 12 in a minute, there are some Christians who will say, I don't need you. I am an ear. What, what do I have to do with you being a foot? That's what he's getting at. So he said some Christians can live individually, like this lady said, I am my own church. But she's mistaken. Then Dr. Brand goes on to say this. I recall the Apostle Paul's use of the analogy in 1 Corinthians 12, where he compares the church of Christ as to the human body. That inspired analogy takes on even more significance for me. The church is like a human body. By saying that the church is a body, we are assuming a human body, not a dead body. We, we, we're not saying that the church is, is like you or like me, so to speak. <laughs> because a human body can be all kinds of things. A human body can, can be healthy, can be unhealthy. They have the Paralympics this, this coming, this, this present week in, in Japan. And, and, and there are some people there who are, who are not like the, the Olympic um, uh, players they had a, a month or so ago. So the human body can, can be quite different. But my friends, listen. When we're talking about the body of Christ, you know, I, I heard, I read just came to mind of a, a lady who had not been to church for a long time. She had a baby that was, this, this little child used to, I don't know what the disease is called, screamed out every so often, then be quiet. And all of a sudden, the child would do the same thing. And when she, the, this was her first time in church for years. And when the service was finished, they surrounded her and tell her, find someone else, find some other church to go to. This is not the church for you. What a tragedy. 
Jesus was willing to have the deformed. Jesus was willing to have the disease to come to him. But the church in the 21st century has no place for people who are different. The body. Now, I want to take you to what I call the significance of the image. The significance of the image. Why is it significant that a body is used? You, you, have, heard, you have heard people saying it, have you not? I have heard them. Perhaps they say it to me because I'm, I'm a pastor of a church. And they will say, I am into Jesus, I'm not into church. My friends, that's impossible. Because the church is his body. So if, if you're into Jesus, you've got to be into church. You can't say, I'm ignoring what the head says even though I'm a part of the body. You can't do it. I can't do it. So, so why, why is this, this image so important, so vital? Number one, because the body is interrelated. I want to express that some more now. The body is interrelated. We learn from Ephesians 4.25 that we are, we, <clears throat> we're told we are members of one another. This term is used again in Romans chapter 12 and verse 5. We are members of one another. We are connected. And, and what I'm going to share with you now is, is really more of the family mentioned here. For example, Paul called Phoebe sister. He had never met Phoebe before. But when, when he became a part of Phoebe's experience and Phoebe's become, uh, becoming a part of his life, he called her his sister because she's a part of the body. Then, then Paul goes on uh, to, to, to say this, in, in 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2, that the interrelatedness of the body is best ex expressed in this way. Appeal to the older men as fathers, the younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters. And it's in interesting, the word for, used for sisters is a Greek word that speaks about sameness of origin. Sameness of origin. So that whether it is a man or a woman in the body, their spiritual origin is the same. One does not become a part of the body because they're educated and the other one is not. Other one has money and the other one does not have and I believe that in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, that one of the wonders that the angels see, Ephesians 3, 10, one of the wonders that the angels see in heaven when we come together is that they see men and women, old and young, coming together, acknowledging one head, singing praise to one head, reaching out to one head, and reaching out to one another. Allow me again. To read Dr. Brand, I love this. But I believe these cells in my body can also teach me about a larger organism, families, groups, communities, villages, nations, and especially <clears throat> about one specific community of people that is linked to a body more than 30 times which is used in, in, the, in the New Testament. I speak of the body of Christ, that network of people scattered across the planet who have little in common other than their membership in the group that follows Jesus Christ. My body, my body, says Dr. Brandt, employs a bewildering zoo of cells, none of which individually resembles the larger body. Just so, Christ's body comprises of unlikely assortment of humans. <laughs> oh, my friends, the body of Christ is made up of an assortment of humans, unlikely 
is precisely the right word. For we are decidedly unlike one another and the one we follow. For whose design, from whose design come this, this, this comical human shapes which so faintly reflect the idea of the body as a whole. Then he goes on to say this. So complete is the identity. He said, I meet strangers in India, and I meet strangers in Africa, or I meet strangers in California. Uh, you know, may I just pause for a minute? Um, Pam and, and, and Duane are on a cruise. And, and they meet a couple from Birmingham, Alabama. They become, they, 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 they hit off immediately. I mean, who wouldn't want to hit off with Pam and Dwayne, you know? And they came all the way to, to visit them last week. Two weeks ago, they were on their way back, and they couldn't make it because of some circumstances, and so... We, we, had invite, we were invited to meet with them. And uh, Lois had that unfortunate situation that happened, so we thought it would not be, be um, possible. But then due to circumstances, we were able to meet last week. And, and, I, and I sat with them. And, and I don't know if it hit you as it hit me. Here is, here is, here is yours truly sitting with two people from Birmingham, Alabama. Just think for a minute. But what's the difference? And not once did we mention you are black and I'm white. The only thing, that we had a glorious time talking about the head. How the head works. How the head delineates direction to each member of the body. We are a living, living organism, friends. And, and so Dr. Brent said, I, I may meet, meet people from all these parts of the world. Instantly we become brothers and sisters, fellow cells in Christ's body. I share the ecstasy of community in the universal body that includes every man, every woman in whom Christ resides. I love that. This is what the body is. And friends, I want, I, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to, to, to awaken you to that this morning. We are interrelated. You are my brother. You are my sisters. I am your brother. We, we're, not just, we're not just individuals. We are members one of another. We're interrelated. And whenever we come to one another, we're coming to part of ourselves. We're coming to interact, to share. That's why it's significant. God wants you to see how absolutely we are related to one another. We are members, we're connected by the head. But then the last part of this is that we are interdependent. We are interdependent. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 to 31, and I'll be speaking about this more next week when we come to the second part of it. But I want you to just sh share with me just for a moment what 1 Corinthians 13 says, uh, 12, and I'm just going to make reference to it and have more to say about it, Lord's willing, next week. But 1 Corinthians 12, look at verse 13. Verse 13, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into one body. So we are, we are related spiritually. And that spiritual connection, that interdependence, actually trumps out everything else so that we're able to relate to one another as we should. Now, Paul goes on. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not of the hand, I am not a part of the body, is it not for this reason any less that it's a part of the body? I can't say that due to my individualism, I am my own church. The church was made to relate to one another. 
We're going to look at it next week. We are to encourage one another. And I cannot encourage someone by myself if I am my own church. I have to be a part. I have to be with others. I have to face others. Then I'm able to do what I'm supposed to do. So uh, Paul goes on to say this. If the foot shall say I'm not of the hand, if the ear says because I'm not an eye, if the, whole, <laughs> if the whole body were an eye, have you ever thought of that? If the whole body were an eye? Can you imagine going to some place and all of a sudden you see this giant eye looking at you? We would, we would I, I forgot the word the kids use today. I don't know if it's the right word, so I better not use it here. But what they say, I, I am, I'm, I'm saying, this is awesome? I don't know. But what is saying? No part of the body can exist without another part of the body. And the weakness of the church, my friends, is because the North American conviction of existence is my individualism. I am it. I am my own church. And the Bible says you can't because the church is a community of believers that are brought together in submission to one head. So no part of the body can function alone. My favorite story, my favorite illustration is that if you have a fireplace that takes wood and you take a piece of the firewood and put it by itself, what happens? It goes out. It needs the heat of the other, other uh, pieces of firewood. And so here's the significance. We are dependent. And we will see next week that the Lord has given each member, each member, a gift which is to be used for the proper function of the church. And that gift will be used in unison and it's dependent upon the other body, just like certain parts of our body depends upon certain things working so that the body can really function as it ought to function. And, and I want you to see, look in verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 12. So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care one for another. You cannot care for someone in isolation. You can only care if you are there, if you are part of the body. Let me close with uh, an illustration that I came upon for this time, because I'll be expanding on this, Lord's willing, uh, next week. I was reading this morning in, in uh, the 11th chapter of Acts, and Paul and Barnabas went to Antioch. And when they were there, they found believers. They had never met them before. But it says that Barnabas was encouraged and he began to encourage them. So did Paul. And they stayed, they stayed in Antioch for over a year. And when they were getting ready to leave, some prophets, New Testament prophets, came and one of them named Agabus got up and he said, that God has made known to me that there will be a famine. A famine that will last for a long time. It will be severe. Now, I want you to follow me here. The believers in Antioch had never met the believers in Judea. But as soon as they heard it, as they were able, they took up a collection and gave to Paul and Barnabas and said, take this to our brothers in Judea. You hear what God said? There could be gaps in a ministry if those that God has gifted are not functioning. So there'd be no division. 
And look at what, look at what they did. And they cared for them. Nobody told them to do it. But because they knew that brothers were involved and brothers had need, they took up a collection. And, and I just wondered, I wonder about it, you know, as I was reading that. I wonder if they would say, well, we don't want to receive that because it's from Gentiles. No, I don't think that's the case. But something gives me a hint. In Romans chapter 15, verse 30, Paul said this. He asked the church in Rome, pray for me that my gift might be received by those to whom it is taken. It is possible, my friends, that God makes a way for us to function together, but because we don't like the way he says it, it doesn't take place. And the church is weakened when the parts are not functioning. And why should it function? Because that's the way that God has designed the body. That's the way he has designed it. And because he has designed it, the only way the body can function is if it works according to the design that God has done. And I trust that as we go through these two Sundays and talking next week, the building, that we will see that these two images are so important if we are to rebuild what the pandemic has been seeking to destroy. And I trust that it will not happen, that we will function as a body that's alive because we are connected rightly, not only to the head, but to one another. Let's pray. Thank you for this image, Lord. We are one body, many members, different members, but oh God, this is the uniqueness of the body of the church. The world knows nothing like it, Forgive us when we have tried their models to see if we can bring unity. Unity comes from being rightly related to God, from whom all blessings flow, so that it will flow from God to members of the body and members of the body to each part of the body and then to the world. I pray that this, the Spirit, as we sung before this message, the Spirit will make these things understandable to each who has heard it this morning, whether here or any other place, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and sing our closing song. With us, O church, arise.
Pray that we were singing our conviction and our vision. That we will function as a body. That the head, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, will be the one who supplies everything we need so that the body image is maintained. You have already done it, Lord. I think of the song we used to sing, Lord, make us one, and I, you know that I never sang that song because you have already done it. And we're asking you to do what you have already done, but make us realize that we are one. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will give us a full unveiling of what it means. Now go before us. Bless the after fellowship, this wonderful time we're looking forward to. We pray that you will be pleased to bless and, Father, to make it a witness again of our support for one another in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please uh, remember, if you are able to stay for a few minutes, that uh, we'll have this ceremony in about five minutes or so.